Today begins our Advent worship series. That is part of a, a series that coincides with a book by James Moore called All I Want for Christmas. One of my favorite songs growing up in the 60s was All I Want for Christmas is My Two Front Teeth, right? Oh, the 60s was such a simple time, wasn't it? But that's the most that a kid wanted. But the world has changed dramatically since then. And we have seen dramatic change in the cultural and social expectations of a consumer-driven culture. And now we want, oh, so much more. And so we enter into the Christian season of Advent. It's a season of, of waiting. We're not to be in a hurry. We're waiting and we are preparing for the coming, for the arrival once again of that extraordinary gift that God has sent to all of humankind. In the midst of all that, I'll admit, the season heightens our own expectation of what we want for Christmas. Have you all started your list yet of what you want for Christmas? But more importantly, the Advent season takes us on a journey. It takes us on a journey and really allows us to remember the story of a baby who would come and change and transform this world forever. The child whose birth we will celebrate on Christmas Eve and on Christmas morning. What do we know about the birth of this child? Well, the social and the political climate during the expected arrival of this child was not without a lot of controversy. In fact, there was considerable controversy during that time. As I described what was going on then, it may even sound a bit contemporary. So, imagine a new leader of the nation telling you that change is coming and life will now be bigger and better and bigger and better military and bigger and better roads and highways and bigger and better commerce and, and everybody will have to prove their citizenship their patriotism, and they better be in support of this new leadership or else. And outsiders would not be welcome, and you would need to fund all these big changes through your taxes, more and more taxes. How would you feel? How would you respond? Well, welcome to Jesus' world at that time, two millennia ago. This is how it was to live under the Roman Empire and its rule in the Middle East two millennia ago. And in the midst of this very oppressive Roman rule, emerged a most ordinary woman, a teenager, actually, they believe, who was engaged to a young man. And one night, this girl received the gift of good news through a miraculous message that she was to have a child. Hmm. Now, I want us to imagine living under an oppressive government as a single, young, expectant mother who had no real means of support of any kind for herself, much, much less for a child. So just imagine the difficulties that would await her. And to begin with, the young man who's part of the equation here, the fiancé, he knew that he was not the father of this baby. Why? Because he knew that they had not been intimate. And so when he learned of her delicate condition, he experienced, as you might imagine, a whole lot of confusion, a whole lot of disappointment. And we know that he even contemplated abandoning his fiance. Now, he knew that he couldn't go public with this information because that would bring shame to both families. And so he just decided to sleep on it and see what the next day would bring. And that night, another miraculous messenger arrives, this time to the young man. So I invite you to listen to the story from Scripture, from the Gospel of Matthew. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, husband-to-be, Joseph, was a righteous man, and he was unwilling to expose her to any public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, 
Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him, say it with me, Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Then the story continues. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And now the next words come from Hebrew Scripture, what we call the Old Testament. Look, the virgin, this is a prophet saying, Look, one day will come when the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So when you hear the word Emmanuel, just be thinking that means God with us. So when Joseph awoke from sleep, He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took Mary to be his wife and had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. Fascinating story, but when you think about it, we don't know a whole lot about this relationship. The Bible doesn't reveal to us how they first met one another. So we can imagine there was young Joseph, And even then, scholars would say he might have been in his 40s because that would have been common for a teenage girl in those days to marry a 30 or 40-year-old. That they somehow saw each other at a social gathering and eventually, as was the custom in those days, the fathers would get involved and they would come together, the two fathers from each family, and they would negotiate the betrothal. They would negotiate the wedding. See how that would work in the 21st century, right? Because in those days, a marriage was considered a covenant between not only bride and groom, but between the two families as well, different from our culture and our society. In due course, the fathers would pound out the details. They would agree to a marriage contract that would be between the two families and the two children. And then the mothers got involved. The parents would get together, and they would gather with the bride and groom-to-be, and they would offer what was called a formal benediction of a blessing over the bride and the groom, and then lots of wine was shared, as was the tradition. All this dictated, signifying that the two now were engaged to be married. Why is this so important for us to, to know the custom of the Jewish people 2,000 years ago? Well, because in those days, Jewish law... See, we're Christians, so we don't really know Jewish law. So 2,000 years ago, Jewish law recognized engagements to people becoming engaged as legally binding. And only divorce could break it apart for an engagement. One had to observe fidelity at this point as unfaithfulness would be deemed adultery by both the religious leaders and the community leaders, punishable by death. More often than not, for just the woman. The woman would die, not the man. (laughs) So that being said, Mary and Joseph would continue their courtship and they would live with their own parents. Intimacy would be avoided at all costs until the wedding ceremony, at which then the two would be one and they would move into the house of the man. So it's Mary and Joseph. They would move into the house of Joseph. Isn't that fascinating? Who is this Joseph, by the way? We look in the Bible, it doesn't say much about Joseph at all. In fact, when we look, um, he's not even given attribution for a single word in the Bible. Everybody else just talking away. Joseph, not a word, right? We do know what he did for a living. He was a tecton, which is a Greek word meaning uh, it'd be like a woodsmith or somebody who worked with stone, perhaps a, a wood carver. It could even imply that one was a kind of a handyman. So whatever he did, the Bible is very clear that he was a man of honor. He was a man who was very honest and righteous before God. And he certainly had no intention to shame Mary or to wish her any harm. And so, think about it, quietly divorcing her and moving on with his life seemed to be the best possible option. But God had other plans. Indeed, God sent a heavenly courier to corroborate Mary's story of this good news that was about to happen. 
this angelic emissary assured Joseph that God had things well in hand. So not to worry. And when Joseph awoke, he remained faithful to God and he remained committed to this relationship, believing that God had a far greater plan. Now here's what I think. I think all of us are a bit like Joseph at times, don't you think? We live our lives where we just want to go about our business. We don't want to ruffle any feathers. We don't want to make any waves, heaven forsake, especially not at work. We don't want to get in any trouble. We like to handle things quietly and without much fuss. And perhaps the lesson for us here is that when we do get compelled to do something, I don't know, reactionary in perhaps a garish or a uh, ostentatious manner that we just might be better served if we would just breathe, be more reserved, and respond quietly, trusting God in whatever situation it is. Now, this wisdom certainly speaks to me in our current social and political climate. I trust God ultimately. Funny thing about this Advent season of waiting and getting ready for Christmas, it wears on us, doesn't it? I mean, it's the first Sunday of Advent. We're all feeling good. I'll visit with you all the final Sunday of Advent. We're going to be tired. This season, for some reason, unrelated to worship, drains us. And the irony is, this should be a season of of filling us, of renewing us. This should be joy-filled, not exhausting. But we become so reactionary to the things around us. We become reactionary. We want to lash out when things don't go our way or when people do the unexpected. Maybe maybe all what we need for Christmas is to just have some peace and quiet in isolation. Amen? (laughs) That would be one path. But Joseph chose another path. A path of, of quiet empathy and compassion. And he had made this decision before he even fell asleep. But what he experienced in slumber was God, doing what God often does, intervening in a very unexpected way. You see, God had sent this messenger who, to paraphrase, basically said, Look, Joseph, I know this is not what you would have ever expected, but it's going to be okay. God is about to do something wonderful. Despite the fact that according to Jewish custom and law, you're in a rather socially unacceptable situation. Oy vey, if angels speak Yiddish. But this had to be reassuring for a trusting servant like Joseph. And so it can be reassuring to us as well, this same message that the unexpected things in life, that tend to exhaust us and wear us down, things outside of convention, sometimes can perhaps be miraculous signs that God truly is at work. Hmm. And amid all the frantic, chaos-filled, less-than-perfect Advent and Christmases, comes an opportunity for us to see this time of the year from a whole new perspective. And so perhaps, just perhaps, if we choose to listen with our open ears and hearts, we may hear this identical angelic message for our own lives. Look, I know life is not going the way that you expected, but it's going to be okay. God is about to do something wonderful. So can we trust God enough to believe in this message. You see, as Mary and Joseph trusted God, they received the gift of good news, and they began that journey toward the very first Christmas. They didn't have a clue where God was going to take them. All they knew was that something wonderful had been promised, (laughs) and they had been invited to follow, and so they rose up, and they followed God. So my friends, may we too rise up And follow God in this season of Advent and in every day of our lives, not knowing where this journey will take us or even know the path that God has laid before us. But may we rise up and follow 
as believers in this incredible gift to all of humankind, may we trust that this journey literally leads us to the remarkable gift of God's love and God's grace. Because for me, that's all I want for Christmas. <laughs> I mean, what an incredible gift of good news of God's love and God's grace coming to us as the Christ child. What do you want for Christmas? Christmas.